So um, we have just finished the chapter where Odysseus left Circe's palace. Remember, Circe was really mean. At first, she turned all of the men into pigs. And then as Odysseus was going to her house to see what in the world was going on, Hermes, the giant killer and messenger of the gods, stopped him. And he said, here, take this plant. This will protect you from turning into an animal. And Circe will do whatever you say. So Circe turns out to be kind of nice. Um, when she's not turning people into pigs and she feeds them and they live with her for a whole year. Um, and as they're ready to leave, Odysseus asks, tells Circe, hey, thanks for keeping us, but it's time for us to go. We want to leave, which is the way to Ithaca. And she says, it's not enough to know the right direction, Circe said gravely. Before you sail, you must consult the soul of Tiresias, the prophet, in the land of the dead. The land of the dead? Odysseus was appalled. No one has ever sailed there. How can a ship reach such a place? Just set your sail and let the north wind take you, said Circe. You must do it, Odysseus, or you will never reach home. Odysseus was terrified at the thought of facing the dead, but he knew he would do as she said, if that was the only way to get back to Ithaca. So Odysseus and his one ship that remains, his one ship out of twelve, are going to the land of the dead. <clears throat> Chapter 5, Ghosts and Monsters Odysseus spent most of the night listening to Circe's instructions. At dawn the next morning, he woke his men and ordered them to get ready for the voyage. Hastily, they left Circe's house and headed down the shore to prepare their ship. All except Elpinor. He had drunk too much wine the night before. Then, because he was hot... He'd climbed onto the roof of Circe's palace and fallen asleep there. When he heard Odysseus calling all the sailors together, he woke up suddenly. Forgetting where he was, he jumped to his feet and fell off the roof. His neck broke and he died instantly. None of the others noticed what had happened. They were all listening in amazement to what Odysseus was saying. We cannot sail for Ithaca yet, he told them. First, we have to go to the land of the dead and ask advice from the prophet Tiresias. So there's Odysseus and all of his men listening to the instructions. And if you look in the corner, there's Circe's house and there's poor old Elpinor falling off. I guess he should have considered that last night when he was drinking all the wine. Um, oh, uh, if you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, Elpinor. Okay. The sailors were afraid, but they obeyed his orders. As they pushed their ship out into the water, Circe came down to the shore with a ram and a black ewe. Uh, a ewe is a girl sheep. Remember, she said to Odysseus, you must sail until you find a grove of poplars and long-leaved willow trees. When you see that, you must walk inland and sacrifice these animals where the two rivers meet, as I told you. She drove the sheep on board and then lifted her staff and waved it in the air, calling up the north wind they needed. All day they sailed across the wine dark sea. As night fell, they reached a wild coast and saw a single grove of poplars and willows, exactly as Circe had foretold. Pulling their ship onto the beach, they walked inland, driving the sheep ahead of them. Soon they saw a steep, rocky pinnacle looming up in the darkness. That marked the place 
where the flaming, where the river of flaming fire joined the river of lamentation. Together, they flowed into the great black Asheron that ran through the land of the dead. So here's the river of lamentation running. Here's the river of flaming fire running. And here they're converging. And there's the land of the dead. This is where we must sacrifice the sheep, Odysseus said. When they smell the blood, the souls of the dead will rise up to meet us. And we will ask them to bring Tiresias. Following Circe's instructions, he poured milk and honey into the trench, adding wine and water and grains of barley. Then he sacrificed the sheep and drew his sword. The souls of the dead came fluttering up from the underworld with hollow, eerie cries. Thousands of them flocked around Odysseus as he stood shivering on the edge of the trench. The ghosts of young men and girls floated next to battle-scarred warriors. Old men with gray hair brushed against newly married, newly married brides. They jostled together, vying for Odysseus's attention. He scanned their insubstantial faces and suddenly he recognized one. Elpinor, how can you be there among the dead? I fell from the roof and broke my neck, Elpinor said mournfully. My body is lying behind Circe's palace. Please go back and give me a proper funeral. I will, promised Odysseus. But first I must speak to the prophet Tiresias. There he is, Elpinor said, coming toward us now. Odysseus turned and saw the shade of a, the old blind prophet rising from the darkness. He stepped forward respectfully, waiting for Tiresias to speak. Noble, Ty noble Odysseus, said Tiresias, I know your heart's desire is to return to Ithaca, but you have angered Poseidon. Because you blinded the Cyclops, his son, he will make your journey as difficult as he can. Are you saying we shall never reach home? Odysseus cried. There is a chance for you all, Tiresias said, but only if you keep your men under control. When you reach the island of Thrinacea, don't let your men touch the sun god's cattle. If they hurt those cattle, your ship will be lost, and all your sailors too. What about me? said Odysseus. You may survive, but if you do, I prophesy that it will be many years before you reach Ithaca. And when you do, you will enter your house in drag and find it full of trouble. Will Poseidon be satisfied with that? Odysseus asked. Tiresias shook his great head sadly. If you want to be free of Poseidon's curse, you must make another journey. Travel inland with an oar over your shoulder until you are far away from the sea. When someone mistakes your oar for a winnowing fan, sacrifice to Poseidon there. Then he will let you live in peace again. So here we have Odysseus, who's still alive in the land of the dead, talking to the soul of the prophet Tiresias. And then there's all those poor old lost souls in the land of the dead. I wonder why these people have bumps on their heads. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Maybe they got knocked in the head before they died. Bowing his head, Tiresias drifted back into the underworld. Then all the other shades 
swirled around Odysseus in a cloud of familiar and unfamiliar faces, chanting their stories to him. But the spirits of the dead cannot stay long in the world of the living. One by one they dwindled away, until Odysseus and his men were on their own beside the thundering rivers. With heavy hearts, they returned to their ship and let the wind carry them back to Circe's island. There at dawn, they built a funeral pyre for their friend Elpinor and cremated him with all his weapons. When his ashes were cold, they built a mound on the seashore so that his name would never be forgotten. After the funeral, Circe and her handmaidens came down to the shore, carrying bread and meat and sparkling red wine. <coughs> you are heroes, Circe said. You have been to the land of the dead and back again. Spend the rest of the day here, feasting with me, and I will tell you all about the dangers ahead, so that you are ready to face them when you sail tomorrow. All day they feasted until sunset. As night began to fall, the sailors settled down to sleep beside the ship. Then Circe took Odysseus by the hand and led him to a place where they could talk privately. You are going to sail into many dangers, she said. First you will come to the sirens, whose song drives men mad with longing. If you succeed in passing them, you will reach the wandering rocks. They wreck every ship that approaches. You must avoid them. But you can only do that by facing a terrible choice. Listen carefully to everything I tell you, Odysseus. Far into the night they sat together, and Circe talked on and on, warning Odysseus about what lay ahead. In the morning, Odysseus woke his men and ordered them onto the ship. Circe gave them a favorable wind and they set sail immediately. When they were safely out to sea, Odysseus told them first, told them the first of Circe's warnings. A great danger lies ahead of us, he said. Soon we shall come to the place where the sirens sing. Everyone who hears them wants to go on listening forever. Unless you close your ears to the sound, you will never reach home, never see your wives and children again. He lifted a ball of beeswax that Circe had given him, working it in his fingers as he spoke. I shall block your ears with this to protect you, but not my own. I am determined to hear the sirens sing, and Circe has told me that the only way and Circe has told me the only way to do that with safety. When I have filled your ears with wax, you must tie me to the mast, knot the ropes tightly so that I can't move. And if I beg you to let me go, just pull them even tighter. As he spoke, the wind dropped and the ship came to a standstill. The sailors looked at one another. They would never get the get past the sirens unless they kept rowing. <coughs> Odysseus went around the ship, plugging their ears with wax. When he had finished, the sailors fetched ropes and lashed him to the mast so tightly that he couldn't move hand or foot. Then they took up their oars and began to row as hard as they could. Very soon they drew up to a flowery meadow that ran beside the seashore. This is where the sirens sat, surrounded by the skeletons of all those who had stayed to listen to their song. As soon as, Od as, soon as they saw Odysseus's ship, they began to sing again turning their heads so that the sound floated out of the water. Come here to us and stop your restless journey, they sang. Come here and listen to the sound of wisdom, 
to all the gathered knowledge of the world, distilled into the music of our song. Come here to us, come here to us, come here to us. That was the song Odysseus heard. It filled him with such longing that he shouted at his men to put down their oars and untie him. When they did not answer, because they couldn't hear, he screamed and ranted, rolling his eyes and making anguished faces. Undo the ropes, he shrieked. Everything I said before was nonsense. Everything is nonsense except the siren's song. Stop rowing. Let me go to them. There's that beautiful siren singing their beautiful song and all these poor old bones of all the poor souls that stopped to listen. If he'd been free, he would have jumped overboard and swum to the shore. But he couldn't move. The sailors obeyed the instructions he'd given them. Two men jumped up and tightened the cords that held him to the mast. The others kept rowing, pulling with all their strength. Some were tempted to stop and unblock their ears. They'd been away from home for more than ten years now, and Ithaca seemed very far away. But they were faithful to Odysseus's orders. Closing their eyes to shut out the sight of the desperate yearning face, they leaned into their oars and pulled and pulled and pulled. And here you see all of Odysseus's men with the red wax in their ears so they can't hear. There's Odysseus in anguish. He wants nothing more than to listen to the sirens. There's the two men pulling his ropes tighter and tighter. <clears throat> and I, I'm, I guess these are, these are Greek words maybe floating through the air, floating, oh, yep, floating into Odysseus's ear. Greek words from the siren song. For more than ten years, Penelope had been staring at the horizon, waiting, watching for Odysseus's ships. How long should a loyal wife wait? Suppose he never comes back. Now people were asking the question openly. And all over Ithaca and beyond, men talked about the beautiful, wise Penelope who wondered who would be her second husband. The only person who never wondered was Penelope herself. I am Odysseus's wife, she said, and I am Telemachus's mother. I will not even think of marrying again until Telemachus is a man. Her determination kept the suitors away for the time being, but there was still no sign of the twelve long ships that had sailed to Troy, and Telemachus kept on growing. So I guess that's Penelope there, watching out to the sea um, on the island of Ithaca. Out on the wine dark sea, the one remaining ship sailed on, away from the land of the sirens. As soon as their song faded away in the distance, Odysseus stopped shouting and struggling. When the sailors saw that, they jumped up and ran to untie him, pulling the wax out of their ears. Thank you for your loyalty, Odysseus said. You are faithful friends. Now, I must tell you. Before he could finish, a great cloud of spray erupted ahead of them, shooting into the sky. There was a thunderous crash of water breaking against rocks. The sailors gasped in terror, <gasps> and Odysseus stared at the spray, with Circe's next warning echoing in his head. If you succeed in passing the sirens, you will reach the wandering rocks. They wreck every ship that approaches. You must avoid them. But you can only do that by facing a terrible choice. They had to avoid that violent, crashing water. 
but the only other route was a narrow strait between two rocky peaks. How could he tell his sailors about the dangers lurking at each one? They had just saved his life by their faithfulness. Now, according to Circe, all he had to offer them was a choice of death or death. I'm going to check my pronunciation, God. Scylla or Charybdis. Scylla, Scylla or Charybdis. Death or death. Scylla or Charybdis. A monster or a whirlpool. <clears throat> Scylla's lair was a cave high up in the taller rock. Every time a ship went past, her six long necks swooped down. Each of her six hungry heads snatched up one of the sailors and ate him. The ships that tried to avoid her steered close to the other rock and fell into the great whirlpool called Charybdis. That meant certain death. Three times a day, the whirlpool's greedy mouth opened up, sucking in everything around it. Three times a day, it changed a direction, spewing everything up again. The force was enough to smash any ship and destroy its crew. Steer close to Scylla's rock, to Scylla's rock, Circe had said, and row as fast as you can. Even so, you're bound to lose six men, but that's better than having your whole crew swallowed up by Charybdis. There was no other way. Odysseus didn't dare to tell his men the whole truth in case they were so terrified that they stopped rowing. He told them only half. We have to sail between those two rocky peaks, he said, pointing at the entrance to the narrow strait. But we must be very careful. Do you see the fig tree growing on the smaller rock? Below that is a gigantic whirlpool. We must stay away from that. He took his sword and stood on the prow of the ship, watching the way ahead. The sailors rode nervously, looking toward the fig tree. As they passed it, the sea underneath began to swirl and boil. A vast hole opened up in the surface of the water, sucking in everything around it. The sailors pulled on their oars, pale with terror, staying as far away from the hole as possible. And that was when Scylla struck. Her ugly heads came shooting out of the cave, darting down toward the sailors. She snatched up the six strongest men and hoisted them into the air. Odysseus, they screamed, save us, Odysseus. What could he do? There was no way of reaching Scylla's cave. He had to watch his faithful companions dangling from her fangs like fish from a lawn. The monstrous heads reared up, shaking back toward her lair, and for a short time, the sailor's screams echoed horribly over the water. Then there was silence. Row on, said fierce, said Odysseus fiercely. Row on as fast as you can. There was nothing else to do. <clears throat> as they went through the strait, Scylla and Charybdis vanished in the distance and a new island appeared on the horizon. As they came closer, they saw that it was completely different from the horrors behind them. Streams of clear, fresh water gleamed golden in the evening light. Rich green grasslands spread out inland from the shore. Across the sea came the sound of cattle, lowing contentedly as they were taken in for the night. <clears throat> To the grieving, exhausted sailors, the island looked like paradise. They imagined themselves rowing ashore and they could almost smell the wonderful scent of freshly roasted meat. But Odysseus remembered the words of the blind prophet Tiresias in the land of the dead. 
When you reach the island of Thrinacea, don't let your men touch the sun god's cattle. If they hurt those cattle, your ship will be lost and all your sailors too. Listening to the sound of the cattle across the water, he guessed that the island ahead was Thrinacea. We mustn't land here, he said. Tiresias warned me about this place, and so did Circe. It belongs to the sun god. We must find somewhere else to anchor. There was an uproar. Are you made of iron? Eurylochus said. Do you think we can go on rowing forever? What's the harm in landing here just for the night? All we want is a chance to step ashore and eat one meal without tossing around on the water. The other men shouted in agreement. They insisted that Odysseus change his mind and let them spend the night on dry land. At last, he nodded reluctantly. Very well, but you must swear not to kill anything on the island, not one cow or a single sheep. The men swore a solemn oath, promising to stay close to the ship and eat nothing except the food Circe had given them. Trusting them to that oath, Odysseus let them steer the ship into a sheltered cove. They went ashore and ate a silent meal, not talking or telling jokes, but remembering their dead companions snatched away by Scylla. They slept beside the ship, intending to go on board again as soon as it was light. But in the middle of the night, a fierce gale blew up, whipping the water into huge breakers. In the morning, there was no hope of setting sail. All they could do was drag their ship up into a cave to keep it safe from the storm. Sternly, Odysseus reminded them of their promise. Remember, you are not to touch any of the cows or sheep on this island. They all belong to the sun, that great God whose eye sees everything. For a second time, the animals swore to leave the animals, uh, the sailors swore to leave the animals alone. They meant it. They had plenty of bread and wine aboard the ship and they didn't expect to be on the island for more than a few days. But then the wind changed. For a whole month, the south wind blew continuously, driving the sea against the shore. It was impossible to launch a ship. They had to stay where they were, and they began to run out of food. When their own food was gone, the sailors began to roam the island, trapping birds and catching fish. But however much they hunted, there was never enough to stop them from feeling hungry. And the hungrier they grew, the more they looked at the sun god's cattle. Odysseus saw them looking and knew there would be trouble if they didn't leave soon. But the wind was still blowing in the wrong direction, and only the gods could alter that. One morning, he left his sailors on the shore and walked inland on his own. Finding a lonely, sheltered place, he prayed to all the gods on Olympus, asking for a change in the wind. He prayed so long and so earnestly that, in the end, he fell asleep. In that hidden place, out of the reach of wind, he slept peacefully for several hours. Back on the beach, the sailors were muttering together while he slept. We can't go on like this, Eurylochus said. Odysseus threatens us with disaster if we touch the sun god's cattle. But what's more disastrous than starving to death? If we don't eat soon, we'll be too weak to sail away, even if the wind does change. Sailors hesitated, remembering their oath. Eurylochus argued harder to persuade them. Let's choose the best of these cows and sacrifice them to the gods. Then we'll have plenty of meat to eat. If we get back to Ithaca afterward, 
will build a splendid temple for the sun god to repay him for his cattle. But we won't get home, said one of the other sailors. Not if we kill the cattle. Eurylochus shrugged. Wouldn't you rather drown than starve to death? That convinced the others. As soon as he finished speaking, they rounded up the best cattle and sacrificed them ceremonially. Then they built a fire on the beach to roast the meat. <clears throat> High on Mount Olympus, the gods heard the angry voice of Hyperion, the sun god. Oh, Father Zeus, he cried. Odysseus's men have killed my beautiful cattle. Give me revenge. Otherwise, I'll go down to the land of the dead and shine there, leaving the world dark forever. Peace, Hyperion, said Zeus, the cloud gatherer. Stay where you are and leave those cattle murderers to me. As soon as their ship is out at sea, I will strike it with a lightning bolt and smash it to pieces. When Odysseus woke up, he started back toward the beach. He hadn't gone very far when he smelled the scent of roasting meat. He guessed what had happened and he ran the rest of the way. What have you done? he shouted. Do you think the gods are blind? The guilty sailors hung their heads, but the harm was done. It was too late to bring the cows back to life. All they could do was wait for the gods to punish them. They were surrounded by terrifying sights. The empty cow hides hunched themselves up and crawled about on the beach. The meat, was roast, the meat that was roasting on spits bellowed over the fire. And from all sides, day and night, came the baleful lowing of ghostly cattle. For six days, the sailors had to live with what they'd done, eating the stolen meat and waiting for the justice of the gods. On the seventh day, the south wind dropped at last. Pushing their ship into the water, they embarked as fast as they could, rowing away from the beach with all their strength. Very quickly, the island disappeared over the horizon. But they couldn't escape the anger of Zeus. When they were out in the open sea, a black cloud appeared from nowhere and settled over the ship. All around them, sunlight glinted on the water, but their ship was in darkness overshadowed by the cloud. Then, without a warning, a savage wind roared in the west. It hit the ship like a hurricane, snapping both forestays. The mast came crashing down in a tangle of sails and rigging, breaking the helmsman's skull. As he slid overboard, there was a giant crack of thunder. A bolt of lightning shook the ship, and everyone was thrown into the sea. The sailors had no chance of surviving in the wild water. One by one, they were overwhelmed by the waves until their bodies floated around like the ruined hull, floated around the ruined hull like a flock of seabirds. There would be no joyful homecoming for any of them. Their voyage was over forever. Only Odysseus managed to stay alive. As the waves tore the ship apart, he seized a leather rope and tied the mast and the keel board together. Clinging tightly to those two pieces of wood, he kept himself afloat as the hurricane drove him through the water. But he couldn't steer his makeshift raft. All night he was thrown from one wave to another helpless as the wind blew, him back toward Scylla and Charybdis. When dawn spread her rosy fingers across the sky, Odysseus was in the narrow strait again, being swept toward the two sharp rocks. The water below the fig tree was beginning to spin as Charybdis prepared to open its greedy mouth. 
Odysseus had no way of avoiding the whirlpool. There was only one possible chance of escape if he was brave enough to take it. As his tiny craft reached the fig tree, he stood up and grabbed at its nearest branch, high above his head. His hands closed around it, but without a foothold, he couldn't swing himself up into the tree. All he could do was cling on, hanging by his arms. Beneath him, the water spun faster and faster. With a horrible, greedy gurgle, it opened up into a black hole that went right down into the depths of the sea. Dangling above it, Odysseus saw it swallow his raft. Then it gaped open again, waiting for him to get tired and lose his grip. Somehow, he managed not to let go. Hour after hour, he held on, watching the whirlpool below him, waiting for the moment when it began to spin the other way. The sun set, and as the sky grew dark, the direction of the water changed. Charybdis began to spew up everything it had swallowed. Odysseus hung on, waiting to see his raft reappear. As soon as the long timber surfaced, he unclenched his stiff hands and dropped into the water. For a second, he was in its power, spinning wildly. Then he hauled himself onto the raft and lay flat out, slumped across the wood. Paddling furiously with both hands, he pulled himself away from the whirlpool as fast as he could, terrified that Scylla would catch sight of him. If she'd seen him, she would have snatched him up in a single mouthful. But it was almost dark, and the evening shadows hid him from her eyes. He came safely out of the perilous strait and into the open sea.